Okay, one final idea in this lecture, and that's L matching for real to real impedance matching. In this case, we're just going to let XS be zero so that we're matching a real valued impedance to another real valued impedance. In that case, uh, I'm going to call one of these impedances R sub low and one of these R sub high. So the lower valued resistance is on one is called R sub low and the higher valued resistance is called R sub high. I'm going to find that I'm always going to want to put the reactants in parallel with the higher valued uh, resistance. And then if I just go ahead and simplify the equations that I get in that case, then I find that the parallel value of reactants, this one here, is given by a very similar expression to what I had before, except with this new notation R high and R low. Again, two possible solutions. And the series uh, reactants is given by this expression, which is a little bit simpler, again, because X sub S is zero. And as I've noted here, X sub par, you will find if you derive this on your own, and I hope you do, always has to go in parallel with the higher valued resistance. And that the series reactance goes in series with uh, R sub low. Again, I strongly recommend you derive this. You can do it one of two ways. You can either start with this circuit and just derive the equations, or you could take the equations that we derived previously and simply set x sub s equal to zero. Either way, it uh, should give you the same solution. Okay, here's a clever trick for simplifying the previous set of equations. What you do is you define a variable here, q. Now, at the moment, q is just shorthand for this quantity here. You will find that if you define this quantity q, being the square root of r sub high divided by r sub low minus 1, and you introduce this into the previous set of equations, those equations get dramatically simpler. Here they are. x sub par becomes simply plus or minus, again two solutions, r sub high divided by q. And the series reactance becomes minus or plus, depending on which one you chose for x par, r sub low times q. So dramatically simpler uh, way to solve those equations or to compute those values uh, when you're doing real-to-real -real matching. So it's very common when doing real-to-real -real matching simply to first compute this parameter q and then to calculate parallel and series reactances using these expressions which are based on q. Now you may anticipate here that q is going to be quality factor and that's true. We don't know why that's true yet, because I haven't brought it up yet, but for now it's just shorthand, and we'll show in a future lecture that in fact this is quality factor, what it means that it's quality factor, and we'll see that this plays a big role in determining bandwidth. So we'll come back to that in a future lecture. Again, I strongly recommend you derive this. Uh, just all you have to do is to make this definition and manipulate the previous set of equations until you get these and confirm that my uh, my statements here are correct. Okay, let's do an example. In this case, we're interfacing 5,000 ohms or 5 kilo ohms to 50 ohms, and we're going to do it at 75 megahertz. Here's all you have to do. You compute Q. Q in this case is 9.95. You calculate the series and parallel reactances using the expressions I just came up with. There will be two solutions. Here are the two solutions indicated as A and B here. In one case we have a shunt capacitor and a series uh, inductor. In the other case we have a shunt inductor and a series capacitor. And those are the values. Those are the two possible solutions you get. At this point you can confirm this uh, on your own uh, and you should. So here are some exercises just to make sure you see what's going on here. First, confirm that you get the same answer using methods from the previous slides. In other words, this is a special case. This should also be the answer if you start off with the most general form of the solution uh, that I showed at the very beginning of this lecture. You should confirm that this is the correct answer using basic circuit theory. Again, here you have 50 ohms in series 
with a inductor. You should be able to compute that impedance. Then you should be able to compute this impedance, which is a parallel combination of this and this, and that should be equal to 5 kilo ohms. So you should be able to confirm these answers, and you can use that doing the MATLAB script that I suggested uh, writing in a uh, previous slide. You can confirm these circuits yield TPG, transducer power gain, equal to 1, using basic circuit theory. Right? You don't have to use S parameters. You could just do basic circuit theory to, to determine the power delivered to the load, the power available from the source, and then uh, the ratio is the TPG. And you can also confirm these circuits yield TPG using S parameter methods, as I suggested on a previous slide. So these are all ways that you can reinforce uh, understanding, make sure you understand everything that's happening here. So I promised I'd say a little bit about bandwidth. In these two circuits that we came up with, uh, they both have frequency responses. In other words, the TPG is one only at 75 megahertz. At all other frequencies, the TPG is going to be less than one. And we can confirm that. We can actually compute the TPG. By the way, once again, I uh, suggest that you do this. You can recreate this plot. Yeah, you should be able to do that. In this plot, I have frequency in megahertz, a TPG. Here's 75 megahertz, which is the design frequency. And at 75 megahertz, I see, in fact, I get TPG of 1, which is 0 dB. And at all other frequencies, the TPG is less than 1, which is what we expect. It must be less than 1 because this is the passive circuit. And a passive circuit, we would expect to see TPG less than 1 for all of the frequencies. There are two possible circuits, and we see a curve for each of those circuits. This one here is the one where the capacitor is in parallel and the inductor is in series. In this one here, the inductor is in parallel and the capacitor is in series. Now what happens is that in this case, we see low pass response. And in this case, we see high pass response. So that is one other basis on which we might select between these two circuits. If there's something else going on down here in this frequency regime, well, we get more rejection of that thing if we choose the high pass response and vice versa up here. So whether you want high pass or low pass response might be yet another reason or another basis on which you select one circuit topology over the other. Let's go back to just a moment to this uh, issue of how to do complex to real matching. We just did real to real matching, but there's an easy way to get from real to real to complex to real that you might not immediately see. I'd like to show that to you. The alternative procedure goes like this. First, use reactance canceling to convert the complex to real problem to the real to real problem. What you can do is, let's say you have a complex valued impedance over here and you're trying to match it to a real valued impedance over here, right? You could do the complex to real problem, but instead you could also throw in a reactance J sub X here and thereby convert this to a real to real problem. And then you can solve the real to real problem using the method we just showed. So if you do this, you're gonna have three components. You have one component here and then two more reactances in this box. Uh, typically, if you choose the right option, you can collapse this back to two components, right? So for example, if you have an inductor here and a capacitor here, and let's say this is an inductor, you could just add up the values of these two inductances and be back to a two component circuit, right? Not always possible, but that's one way to go about this. Now a summary. I talked about three ways in general to go about designing L-type matching circuits. One was a general method for complex to real matching. Second one was a simplified method for real to real matching, which uh, resulted in the introduction of this parameter Q, which will have future relevance to us, in particular concerning bandwidth. And then thirdly, 
simplified complex to real matching using reactance canceling. So you do reactance canceling to get rid of the reactive component, the complex impedance, and then you do real to real matching. And then hopefully you can arrange the circuit to eliminate one of the three resulting reactances. All three of those methods are commonly used. You will probably end up using all three at some point in this course. And then I talked about the considerations that come up in selecting among the myriad various impedance matching circuits we can develop. One was compatibility with DC biasing. That will be a huge issue for us later in the course when we design transistor amplifiers. We have identified the fact that these things are going to have bandwidth, and that bandwidth may be either too small or too large, and we want to adjust it. That's a topic of a future lecture. And then we talked about component availability. Are the values reasonable? Uh, will they have frequency limitations? Again, we'll see this issue come up over and over again. We'll talk about various ways to address it. This concludes this lecture on discrete two-component L matching.